I have, for many years, have done work on the evolution of banking systems, trying to make sense of the way that banking systems shift their shape. Um, but there are a couple of fundamental principles which help us really to understand how we got to where we were in 2007. <clears throat> I want to start right at the beginning um, and show how the twin principles of profitability and safety um, have shaped the way banking has developed. Um, at the end of the talk, um, right up to date, I want to make some remarks about um, how a neoclassical economist might approach the whole question of banking and, and why they couldn't predict the crisis, a crisis couldn't happen uh, in their way of thinking, um, and uh, hope to persuade you that an approach which takes account of history and of institutions is a more fruitful way of dealing with the question. And as I say, from the very beginning, profitability and safety are the twin drivers of um, what develops into banking. In 1640, Charles I raided the mint where people kept their, their gold. Uh, he needed money, he just took it. And after that, uh, the mint was thought not a very safe place uh, to leave her money. And the goldsmiths, who had the appropriate um, safekeeping facilities, were then used as, as storage facilities for money. Um, and the goldsmiths would issue a receipt for any deposit they received um, and soon learned that these deposit receipts were circulating instead of the gold itself. People would accept receipts if they knew the goldsmith and, and knew the person uh, who was supposed to have deposited money uh, and would accept these in lieu of coin. <clears throat> well, the goldsmiths weren't stupid. They soon had the idea that they could issue more receipts than the gold they actually had. And what is known now as fractional reserve banking was born. Um, <clears throat> the risk, of course, was that um, claims would be made against these receipts for the return of the gold uh, in, in quantities which the goldsmiths couldn't handle. This we call now convertibility risk, uh, and your bank promises to, to pay you in another form of money, notes and coin, in exchange for your deposit, uh, and runs this convertibility risk on a daily basis. Against this risk, they hold liquid assets um, and hope that those assets will be sufficient to meet any calls um, for the conversion of deposits into another form of money at any time. Um, gradually, deposits became uh, understood as a very good substitute for money, um, were taken up by a large number of people, um, and banks sprang up <clears throat> to make money off lending um, in great numbers. They also failed in great numbers. This is England I'm speaking of. Scotland was a little bit um, more conservative and possibly a little bit luckier too. Uh, and didn't have such an upheaval in the establishment of, of the banking system. Um, Things were particularly sticky uh, during the Napoleonic Wars when <clears throat> convertibility into gold was suspended for a while and banks grew apace because they were free of their convertibility risk. Um, uh, many banks grew up and when
payments in gold were resumed, banks failed in equally startling numbers. <clears throat> but all this time, the whole question of banks and their liabilities were not seen as appropriate uh, subjects for monetary theory. Deposits weren't understood as money. They were called credit. Um, and banks were a private matter. Clearly, there was no idea that banks were too big to fail. They were failing like flies in this period. <clears throat> um, but once bank deposits became fairly widely accepted um, and thought of as a kind of money, the relation between the state and the money supply was radically altered. Now there were private suppliers of near substitutes for money, as well as um, coin uh, under the direction of the treasury. And of course, in 1694, uh, the Bank of England was founded and were, were soon authorized to issue notes. <clears throat> that latter arrangement was a clear case of government franchising out to the Bank of England, a private institution, um, the provision of money, and then what was going on in the, the rest of the banking system, uh, they took no interest in whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> gradually, it became clear that having an unstable banking system banking system prone to failure of various kinds was not particularly healthy and the Bank of England took on the kinds of responsibilities that we today associate with central banking. In particular, the provision of liquidity when there was a systemic need for it um, and also providing an individual bank which was solvent but not liquid with emergency liquidity. <clears throat> I've argued elsewhere that this arrangement amounts to monetary policy being orientated toward keeping the value of deposit money exchangeable at par with the monies supplied by the state and the Bank of England, um, and that this amounts to a state involvement in private banking, which at the moment they are loath to acknowledge. Um, <clears throat> I've argued that as long as there is bank regulation um, and lender of last resort facilities, the state is involved whether they acknowledge it or not, and the banks are never entirely private enterprises. <clears throat> It's a very curious fact that that agency relation um, has never been debated uh, in this country uh, in any serious way. Um, but it's a fundamental fact which ought to shape our understanding of regulation and supervision uh, of the banking system. <clears throat> but the message that I want to draw for this purpose explaining uh, the crisis is that the process <clears throat> by which deposits became seen as a kind of perfect substitute for money was a very long, drawn out and unstable um, period. It took about 200 years and the message that I draw from that is that if you're going to introduce a money substitute, you ought to do it pretty gradually until you find out what the market will bear. Um, any sudden spurt of growth in either an individual bank's balance sheet or the number of banks is likely to end in tears. But banks have ways of managing their liquidity <clears throat> they developed branches um, and 
correspondent relationships with banks in London. The banks in London had access to the discount houses and could shift liquidity through the discount houses, getting rid of their excess, which didn't earn them any profit, um, and finding uh, liquidity uh, to satisfy uh, a sudden unexpected needs through this relationship. And the discount houses had access to the Bank of England. So there was a way of managing liquidity, which then became very efficient because it was systemic, but also, of course, rather fragile <clears throat> because the um, amount of liquid assets held in the system against the convertibility risk um, was pared down on account of its not being a high yield, set of high yield assets. As Keynes pointed out, however, when banks expand together, then there's no control over the liquidity uh, which they're going to need, and then it falls to the central bank to supply it. And this, this was eventually uh, enshrined in, its, in the Bank of England's practice. <clears throat> Moving swiftly into the 20th century and indeed its second half, uh, in the 1960s, um, the confidence banks had in their being able to meet their convertibility clause um, was further increased by the Bank of England actually um, developing uh, the theoretical background to supplying cash on demand. Um, it was argued that the liquid asset ratios which banks were required to hold couldn't be used to meet their liquidity needs. Um, so it was really like a tax on, on the banking system on, in favor of the Bank of England. Um, <clears throat> and that most of the fluctuations in banks' liquidity needs were anyway seasonal and therefore inconsequential. So the Bank of England took the line that they would simply supply cash as it was demanded by the banking system. Well, the banking system, of course, um, could easily exploit this. Uh, when they learnt to um, uh, withdraw support from government securities, this would force the Bank of England to supply more liquidity. <clears throat> Even when the bank wanted to keep interest rates uh, from rising, uh, they would then have to supply cash on demand to the banking system. So um, the Bank of England, in effect, in the 1960s became a kind of lender of first resort of liquid assets. You could say that liquidity was now being, being managed centrally rather than by individual banks. The responsibility for managing liquidity was now um, on the shoulders of the Bank of England. <clears throat> Well, as I say, profitability and, and safety are the two drivers, and profitability led to this centralization of liquidity and the paring down of the holding of liquid assets in the system as a whole. <coughs> Not long after this um, peculiar arrangement by the Bank of England uh, of supplying cash on demand, uh, it promulgated one of the most important pieces of policy uh, that this country's banking system has seen, something called competition and credit control, which was introduced in 1971. <clears throat> competition and credit control represented quite a substantial change uh, in the structure of the banking system in this country. Uh, the banks had been a cartel 
they'd agreed interest rates, therefore there was no incentive for depositors to shift their money around, therefore the bank's funding base was quite secure. Um, competition and credit control um, opened up competition between the banks and one, one another by breaking up the cartel and between the banks as a class and building societies as a class by um, applying liquid asset ratios to both sets of institutions. Uh, before that, only the banks had been subject to liquidity ratios um, and making it somewhat easier to treat what were known as building society shares more like deposits. <clears throat> so the banks were now thrown into open competition with one another and with the building societies. The building societies um, took steps to make their deposits as easy to use as money as bank deposits were. Um, there were impediments to doing that before. And the banks competed with the building societies on the asset side of their balance sheets. That is to say, they took on mortgage lending in a big way. Now, mortgage lending had been thought to be much too long term for banks to um, get into. Uh, the maturity mismatch between their loan book and their liabilities was too great to allow banks to get into mortgages, but they went in with both feet. And now it's the majority of their private lending uh, book. Um, <clears throat> competition and credit control uh, was absolutely uh, based on the idea that uh, the banks were legitimate businesses and should be uh, free to do as they pleased um, without as much um, government intervention as they had experienced before. Um, it is therefore the first piece of neoliberal legislation to which the financial system was subjected in this country. With competition and credit control, the Bank of England washed its hands of uh, responsibility for the money supply supplied by private banks. Um, the intensification of competition meant that banks' profit margins were eroded um, and that put further pressure on them to reduce their liquidity, their liquid assets. Um, and they did that. Uh, and they went into liability management, which meant paying interest on their deposits, which uh, again further eroded their profitability. <clears throat> and eventually their liquidity cushion was so thin um, that they had looked around for other sources um, and noticed that in the US um, the phenomenon of securitization had been developed. Now, just at that time, um, we also had the um, introduction of capital adequacy controls, the first Basel Agreement, Basel I, um, in 1989. <clears throat> Basel I um, was a comparatively simple device um, requiring banks to hold particular types of capital against their risk-weighted asset portfolio. The idea was to get them to hold more liquidity, I suppose, and fewer risky assets. Um, you would rank the liquid assets as, uh, as not risky and then apply weights. Going to, it was a very crude and simple system, but very effective, um, weighting other assets uh, by the amount of risk they entailed. Uh, and against the, the sum of these risk-weighted assets, you had to hold a certain amount of capital. 
So the idea was to get banks to hold um, fewer risky assets and a bit more liquidity. But what the banks did was to look across and see securitization as a way of making their formerly completely illiquid assets, their loan book, uh, saleable, <coughs> liquid. Um, now, I, there has been so much talk of securitization that I don't suppose you need to, me to tell you what that means, but essentially it's a way of packaging up the loan book uh, in a way that makes it attractive to buyers. Um, so the, the, the loans are shifted off the books. You don't need to hold capital against any of the um, loans that you've so packaged and sold. Um, and you've, re you've regained a certain amount of liquidity. Um, now this uh, phenomenon came only three years after what is known as the Big Bang, in which um, the whole stock market and, the, and dealing in uh, shares was completely reorganized. And amongst the provisions of Big Bang, um, banks were allowed to trade um, on their, in, in their on their own account, um, <clears throat> and that eroded the distinction, which had been customary but not subjected to any legal um, constraints, between retail and investment banking. So, all right, you have all the seeds of the current disaster now in place. But they were brought in, into being largely by competition um, forcing down liquidity uh, and, and encouraging other forms of lending which were less liquid and more risky. Um, and this brought us to what I call the great mutation. We've had the great moderation, that was a damp squib. The great mutation is still with us. Um, <laughs> These three elements, competition and credit control, Basel I and the Big Bang, completely changed the nature of banking. Um, and from our point of view, not only the capacity to uh, engage in proprietary trading in very risky speculations, but also the structure of um, the asset side of bank balance sheets was utterly and completely altered. Um, add to this a very rapid innovation in financial techniques and the speed with which speculation could take place was also transformed. Um, the, the most important thing it seems to me in the whole complex story, in fact, it is securitization. Because moving the loans off the balance sheet meant that banks were no longer concerned, really, to evaluate closely the capacity uh, of their borrowers to repay, and they were in no position to monitor those repayments. Um, what they were really after now um, was the origination fee. They start a loan and then package it up and sell it off, wash their hands of it. And whatever happens to it has nothing to do with them. Um, it's called the originate and distribute business model of banking. It is a disaster. Um, the banks thought and they persuaded the regulators that by selling these packaged um, debt obligations, collateralized debt obligations, they were distributing risk and by distributing risk were reducing it because people's portfolios 
uh, were diversified and so on. Uh, this took no account of the systemic risk that was involved, which caused all the trouble. Um, not only did systemic risk rise with um, the introduction of these instruments, but the whole ethical basis of banking also broke down. There are other factors in this too, but um, not having responsibility for the quality of your borrower or uh, the borrower's uh, performance um, is one of the crucial uh, elements of the breakdown of ethical banking. I think there are several lessons here. Uh, one is that the speed with which change takes place is a very important element in whether that change will succeed or fail and bring the bank with it. We had the story of the substitution of deposits for other kinds of money taking 200 years to catch on. Um, and then in the last 30 years, um, the tremendous pace of financial innovation has spawned assets that actually we now know nobody understood. Uh, and it's not surprising that when it all unraveled, um, uh, the effects were a disaster. The second lesson is that liquidity matters. I don't need to spell that out, I'll just remind you of it. Um, also, secure funding matters. I only brushed on this, but um, in the days when banks were a cartel and, and deposits didn't move about, they had a very secure funding base. Um, now it is less secure, and furthermore, they've leveraged themselves so much that they've gone to um, much flightier sources of short-term capital. This is what brought down Northern Rock. Deposits were only 22% of its total liabilities. They were relying on other kinds of funding, uh, all of which was much more mobile uh, for the bulk of their liability side. <clears throat> the fourth lesson, I think, is that lending ought to entail responsibility. It, it's not good enough to originate and distribute and wash your hands of it. Um, and the fifth is that if the state franchises out um, the control of the money supply to private enterprise, it continues, as any franchisor does, to have a duty to monitor the quality of the product, um, which it is currently not doing, and even set, sets its face against doing on the grounds that banks are purely private. They are not purely private. Under current arrangements. <clears throat> well, those are the conclusions that I draw from looking at this kind of thing from an evolutionary point of view. Why is it that um, neoclassical economics, the kind of economics that you're taught, um, would not take that kind of view? Well, in the first place, it is historical. It's an historical story. And economics prides itself on um, looking for universal laws which hold under you know, a wide variety of circumstances. It's pie in the sky, it's crazy to do that. History changes behavior, and when behavior changes, your theory about the results of that behavior has also got to change. Um, a theory of money when money was only coin, is going to change when you introduce credit-based money, bank money, uh, as, a, as a perfect substitute. Otherwise, you know, you're stuck with the quantity theory of money into a period when it doesn't apply at all, if it ever did. Um, secondly, The structure of institutions
much emphasized by Ha Jun Chang yesterday, um, influences behavior, uh, shapes behavior, shapes our understanding. And again, many economists, not all, but many mainstream economists say proudly that economics is institution free. Um, I can't understand how it can possibly be institution free, but that's what they argue. Again, it comes back to wanting laws which are universally held. On smaller matters, um, it was believed that financial assets, assets in general, were efficiently priced. It's called the efficient markets hypothesis. Um, it, they, were, they were given their true value. If all assets are given their true value, you can sell them instantly at that value, can you not? And if that's the case, all assets are equally liquid. Liquidity doesn't mean anything. And one of the key elements in the whole history of banking is this question of balancing liquidity against profitability. Where liquidity does mean something because assets are not perfectly priced. Anyone who still believes the efficient markets hypothesis after the market collapse of 2007-8 um, really ought to be considered for committal to an institution <laughs> of another kind. <laughs> Um, but you, you will still find it um, appearing in textbooks written after the crisis, I dare say. Another very influential um, idea is the Modigliani-Miller theorem, which argues that sources of funding do not matter. Um, it, it is shown uh, in this um, piece of work that provided there are no transactions costs of buying and selling, uh, that the transition, the, the um, extent of gearing or leverage uh, is of no consequence because you can always transfer one form of uh, funding into another um, at zero cost. Again, you have perfect markets at the back of that, uh, and we know perfectly well that markets are not perfect, that taxation favors, uh, it differs in different countries, uh, one kind of um, funding means over another. Capital gains are usually taxed at less than interest, so this favors equity funding. Um, and in the case um, of banks, Again, it's the stability of their funding rather than the price of it, which I think um, matters rather more. Um, but stability is not part of the, um, the, the concern uh, of the efficient markets hypothesis, since you can trade freely at zero transactions cost um, uh, on a perfect market. What is the need for stability? just transfer one asset into another. Um, so these are the main elements of um, difficulty for a neoclassical economist understanding the crisis as we had it. Um, and I hope to persuade you that those elements discredit <laughs> that approach. Uh, I'm, I'm far from saying that my approach is the only approach, but it is an approach which tells you something about why what happened did happen uh, and why neoclassical economists not only didn't predict the crisis, but can't explain it ex post either. Um, and on that little note, I'll open the floor for questions as soon as one can come and collect her watch. <laughs>